so welcome everyone to today's grants and sponsored research initiative or GRIT seminar hosted by the Research Program on Children and Adversity, the RPCA at Boston College School of Social Work. My name is Teresa Betancourt. I'm Salem Professor of Global Practice at the School of Social Work and I direct the RPCA. This seminar series was uh, founded as part of the U19 National Institutes of Mental Health Youth Forward Implementation Science Hub uh, that we uh, support in Liberia and Sierra Leone and their global network of other scale-up hubs around the world. Our other partners in this work include the Essence and the Shine U19 hubs and the University of Rwanda Center for Mental Health as well as now we've got some new capacity building partners today joining from Sierra Leone. Uh, before I welcome today's speaker, I'd like to announce that we'll be holding more GRIT seminars in the spring, including an upcoming exciting session with Dr. Pamela Collins uh, on March 29th. And Pamela, as you know, used to run the Global Mental Health Program at the National Institutes of Mental Health and is now on faculty at uh, University of Washington in Seattle. Uh, and so please visit the RPCA website for details on these events and how to register. If you're interested in watching past grid seminars, they can be found on our RPCA YouTube entitled RPCA Lab SSW. Also, I'd like to announce that we're hiring for multiple PhD level positions. So if you're interested, visit our website and also contact Tesla Abrego uh, and her, we'll try to get a slide up with her email on it for more information. And now uh, I'm pleased to announce today's GRIT speaker, Dr. Sonia Kritikova. Dr. Sonia Kritikova is Deputy Research Director at the Institute for Fiscal Studies, an economics research institute based in London. She has a PhD in economics and her research focuses on understanding the determinants of skill acquisition among children and young people living in poverty, as well as more broadly, the mechanisms through which childhood conditions manifest in child development and other outcomes. Uh, today, Sonia will present on improving early childhood development in rural Ghana through scalable community-run play schemes. So we're grateful to have you with us today, Sonia. Thank you so much, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Let me just uh, share my screen. Get, um, get the slides up. Okay, can you see the slides? Yep. Yep, yep brilliant. Um, okay, thank you very much for having me. It's great to be presenting to this audience. I'm really looking forward to comments and feedback and, and um, interaction afterwards. I have to warn you that I have three kids on the loose in the house, and so I apologize in advance for any disruptions. Um, so with that, uh, I want to get started. Um, so I, there's sort of two parts to this presentation. Most of this presentation, I'm going to be talking about an efficacy trial we conducted of this early childhood education intervention um, in Ghana, and I will I will present the design and, and the results of that trial. Um, but following on from that trial, the results of that trial have resulted in the government of Ghana um, committing to scale this program um, quite significantly over the next four years. And they're now working with us um, to try and embed a trial of that scale up. Um, and so kind of a, an effectiveness trial. Um, and so we, we're in the process of getting funding for that, but we've been shaping the design of that project and, um, and the kind of key questions and key challenges and I'd love to have the time to also tell you a little bit about that um, and start talking about giving your experience, especially in implementation research, um, to start thinking about what we're missing and what more we should be thinking about. Um, but starting first with the, um, uh, with the main uh, part of the presentation. Sorry, I'm just trying to move it so I can see my whole slide. Okay, so, um, I don't need to uh, really make a big case to this crowd. I don't think um, that um, it's important to uh, evaluate early childhood education programs in developing country contexts, but just big picture, we have evidence that early childhood deprivation can have meaningful um, adverse long-run consequences and that interventions can be effective at ameliorating these. But we uh, continue to have big evidence gaps um, in how to go from the evidence we have to early childhood programming at scale in places where the need is greatest, that's low and lower middle income countries. And that's because in a nutshell, uh, at the risk of oversimplifying things, 
Um, a lot of the evidence is from high and middle income country contexts. Um, a lot of the evidence we have is based on small sample studies uh, of state of the art programs. So Perry School has gotten a huge amount of attention, but that's obviously very different from the kinds of programs that are uh, implementable and scalable in rural, uh, poor, developing country contexts. Um, and on top of all of that, the evidence we do have is mixed uh, in a way which would suggest that content and quality of implementation are important. And so external validity of the existing evidence might be limited. So you really need to be studying these questions in a particular context and paying close attention to the specific features of programs. We can't just generalize from Perry School worked in this context and therefore another early childhood program will work in, in a completely different context. And so with this big gap in mind, um, what we do is, um, sorry, I'm trying to minimize the, um, what we do is um, study the effectiveness of a scalable early childhood education program called Lively Minds, which was developed for and implemented in a rural sub-Saharan Africa in Ghana and Uganda. Uh, and it targets cognitive and socio-emotional development and health of preschool age children. Um, the key features of this program that are, I think are worth highlighting are that it's, um, it's a low intensity, low cost community run play schemes. At the heart of it are these low intensity, low cost community run play schemes um, with additional components uh, focused on parenting skills and um, sanitation wash. Um, it's, a, apologies, it's a scalable model. It's run by uh, women from the villages where it's being implemented and it relies entirely on locally available resources. In terms of costs, the model that we evaluate and for which I'm presenting evidence today um, cost about $37 per child, uh, but the scaled version, and I'll explain a little bit more about that, and, and the, especially the version which is planned to be scaled by the government is going to cost $7 per child. Um, now, until recently, uh, although the model is scalable, it was not implemented in a scalable way in the sense that it was run entirely by a small NGO. Um, so from cu curriculum development to training, to day-to-day -day management, to oversight, to financing, everything. Um, and they have recently moved to a model where they have integrated the program into government-run preschools in Ghana. And so what we present here is evidence of a trial of that program, of that more, so it's not just uh, a scalable program, it's the scalable implementation model as well. Um, just to say that I'd be very happy to take questions while I'm presenting um, clarifying questions or any other questions. So if you want to come in with questions, please do. Um, There's a question actually that just came in in the chat. Can you see that? Oof, that's asking too much of my technical. That's oh, okay. Um, uh, Sarah, would you like to pose your question? You can unmute yourself. Oh yeah, you just said uh, the cost is 37 per child, and I wonder if that's monthly or for the length of the intervention, which is how long again? Yeah, so uh, this is, sorry, I'm just giving this kind of overview at the moment. This is to give you ballpark figures. This is for, for the duration of the program for a child. Uh, so the child goes to KG for two years, so this is for the duration of that time. Uh, and obviously that's important, that's interesting in the context of what we find uh, on impacts. Um, but this is to say that, um, just to give you a kind of some idea of the scale uh, of, of this program. Okay. Um, in terms of where we see our contribution, well, uh, it, we, we sort of think of a few things that we're doing. First, we're providing evidence on uh, the impact of an early childhood intervention in a context where evidence on these things is very uh, scarce still. Um, the intervention has this interesting hybrid component, which isn't that common in early childhood interventions, in the sense that on the one hand, it improves parenting skills of participating mothers, and I will say a lot more about how the program is designed to explain. Um, but on the other hand, through the play schemes, it benefits a wider group of children. So it's a sort of play scheme program in preschools, but at the same time, it's being run by participating mothers who are also parents of some of the kids and their parenting is being improved through this program. So it has this innovative hybrid element. Um, we, we pay quite a lot of attention to measurement in the way that we conduct the evaluation. Um, we try to capture multiple dimensions of child development. Um, 
we try to measure key behavioral and material inputs. Um, and um, we're doing this in the context of non-specialist large-scale survey. Um, and so we're using lay surveyors, for example, to do all of this. So that requires um, adaptation of measures and careful selection of measures. Um, these measures allow us to do more than just look at impacts of the program, but try and disentangle some of the mechanisms um, by looking at the effects of intervention on behavior. Um, uh, and that also allows us to say something potentially about what inputs are important for what dimensions of child development. And hopefully you'll see what I mean by that when I kind of go through the, the findings that we have. I guess most importantly, our contribution has been that the findings from this trial were received very well by the government of Ghana um, and they have agreed to, and on the map here, you can see uh, the green areas are where the uh, program is currently ongoing, Lively Minds program. The gray areas are the scale up that the government has agreed to. So they will be taking over the running of the program and scaling to all of these areas. Uh, and the evaluation of that scale up is what, what I want to get to um, at the end of this presentation. Are there any questions before I move on to the study context? Okay, so um, the study is set in um, two districts of Ghana. So Tolan district, they are marked in red on the map, Tolan district in the Northern region and Bongo district in the Upper East region. Uh, now these are uh, quite deprived areas with particularly poor um, outcomes. So slightly outdated statistics, but in the 2011 national education assessment, these were two of the three lowest performing regions. So the, these districts are in two of the lowest performing regions in terms of the national educational assessment. Uh, and you can see median educational attainment of women in these areas in Northern and Upper East regions are well below the national average. That's at the bottom of the slide here. Now from our own baseline data, and I will tell you more about um, our sample, but just to give you a little bit of a flavor, we our findings are kind of in line with this. If we look at learning outcomes of the children in our sample, um, we have three to five-year-olds is the, the focus group. And um, in our sample, one and three can count um, three counters and one in 10 can do a four piece puzzle. Uh, and this is kind of matched by challenging kindergarten and home environments. Um, we, although the attendance is pretty good, so we have three out of four eligible children attending kindergarten in the last 12 months. Average class sizes are very large with 58 children, and we find uh, on average eight children per desk. Um, similarly, caregivers have very low education. You saw that in the, in the statistics I just talked about, but in our data as well, almost 75% of caregivers have no schooling. Um, and if we, and we have more measures on this that I will talk about, but just to give you an idea, 13% of household report conducting any play activities with their children in the last three days in our data. Um, so this is a, uh, a, a context with poor learning outcomes and challenging kindergarten and home environments from a perspective of early childhood development. In that context, I want to kind of tell you more about what the Lively program, Lively Minds program is. So this is uh, at the heart of it, as I said, our play schemes where children play fun and interactive games that strengthen cognitive language and socio-emotional skills. Now it's run by volunteer mothers. So these are women who volunteer to participate in the program uh, and they come to kindergartens and run these play schemes. Uh, during that time, they are supervised, they're trained and supervised by KG teachers. Um, each child has at least one indoor and two to three outdoor sessions per week as part of this play scheme scheme. And the, uh, the teachers and the mothers also install additional tippy taps and encourage good hygiene practices like hand washing during the time that the kids are in KG and the volunteer mothers in their homes as well. A key focus of the program is to maintain uh, very low ratios. So one volunteer mother teaches five to six children in small groups and no more. Um, and each mother only teaches about an hour per week. So this is, this is relying on mothers volunteering their time, but also um, designed to ensure that there is not too much of a, an imposition on their time. 
So this diagram here kind of is meant to give you a little bit more of an idea of how the play scheme works. Within the class, you have five stations, um, at which, each of which plays different types of games with the kids and kids spend 10 minutes at each station and then move on. Now at each station, there is one volunteer mother and each station will have no more than five to six children at a time. So kids rotate around and do all of these activities. And then there's also a mother um, who runs outdoor games with the kids. And here, obviously, there, there are a lot more kids per mother. Just this is a picture of um, what the activities uh, that are undertaken on at each of these PlayStation look like. Um, so they include um, building, counting, shapes and senses, matching. And you can see um, uh, you can see these activities here. All of these materials are made by the volunteer mothers just using the resources that are available in the community. It doesn't rely on bringing in any learning materials. Finally, um, in terms of how this is implemented, so the model that we're evaluating, remember initially this was set up, the program has been running for about 10 years. Um, initially, this was all run by Lively Minds and actually the play schemes were run outside the KGs. Now that it's been integrated with the government education system, the way that it works is Lively Minds actually work at the district level. They come in and they sensitize the district um, to the needs, the importance of early childhood, the value of this program, and why the district should commit to supporting the implementation of the program. Uh, they then sign a, an MOU with the district and the district selects a place scheme team um, who then undergo training from Lively Minds. That team then recruits the teachers and the schools that are going to be implementing the program uh, and has a training of trainers workshops. So the district play scheme team runs the training of trainers workshop, although that is also overseen by Lively Minds. The teachers then go off to the communities, mobilize their volunteer mothers and train them. They mobilize about 30 to 40 mothers per community. And they train them through eight training sessions following two community mobilization meetings. And there are very stringent demands on attention where mothers are not allowed to continue if they miss more, more than two sessions from what I remember. Then the, once the mothers have been trained, they start running the play schemes in the KGs under the supervision of the teachers and occasional visits from higher level district education authorities. I can see there's some questions coming up in chat. Is it worth just pausing for a minute to try and answer some of those? Sonia, I wrote some of the answers because uh, okay, cool. uh, these are things that uh, you're going to get in a few slides. Perfect. So just one quick clarifying question. So is right. the length of the school day basically one hour for these children? They're at the center for one hour per day? No, the length of the school day is longer and actually I can't tell you exactly how long it is. So the idea, the play scheme is not, is not implemented during the whole day that the kids are at school. So the mothers will come in at some point during the day, run the play scheme and then they will leave. Now, during the time that kids are in KG in general, the, the, one of the issues with kindergartens is that they're fairly unstructured. Kids don't do very much during that time. Um, but they are in KG for longer than the time that the play scheme is run. Is that, does that answer the question? Thank you, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'll move on then to the design of our study. Um, so we implemented this over the 2017-2018 academic year. Um, and uh, so during that time, in terms of Lively Minds activities, in August, September, they did mobilization activities in, in treatment um, and control communities. I'll tell you about mobilization and control communities and what treatment and control are. Um, then they did the training and the play schemes were running between November and July in the treatment communities. The play schemes then were expanded out to control communities um, the following year in 2018, 2019 academic year from November. Now, um, our evaluation, we, we sampled from a list of all schools that opted into the program that expressed an interest in participating in the program. And we sampled 80 schools out of that and uh, randomly allocated them to treatment and control. We then screened households around those schools. Um, and uh, we had a particular strategy of going up to a certain number of households in order to identify eligible households, that is households with kids who are about to go into KG. And out of those, 
we've sampled around 30 households per community or per school. So in total, we have a sample of around 2,400 children. Um, uh, and they're split between treatment and control, 1,216 in treatment and 1,191 in control. Then um, we conducted the baseline before the start of the play screens between September and October 2017 and end line a couple of months after the play schemes ended between September and November 2018. We have about 6% attrition between baseline and end line, but it's not a correlated so it, it doesn't look different between treatment and control. We also conducted a quick midline um, where we haven't incorporated the results from that in our analysis yet um, on a subset of the children. In terms of the um, data we collected, we assess children in their households, and I'll talk more about what kind of assessments we do. We also interview their primary caregiver who tended to be the mother in the great majority of cases. Um, it, that included uh, both assessment of her um, well-being, but also a, a lot of questions about the household, the economic situation, the household um, knowledge about child development, um, the demographic characteristics of the household uh, activities with the child. I'll, I'll kind of highlight the relevant measures a bit further on. Uh, we also uh, captured, we had measures of the preschool environment as well as interviews with the teacher. That data we're not using in this analysis primarily because we're very underpowered to really detect anything with 80 schools. Um, so what we're really focusing on are these data that we collect in the households through assessment of the children, as well as interviews with the primary caregiver who tended to be the mother. And we have two rounds of those data from baseline and end line about a year apart. So, um, now, a particular feature of the design that I want to draw your attention to um, is this mobilization in control communities. Uh, I mentioned to you that um, the program is implemented through these volunteer mothers. So really, um, among the kids who receive the program, for some of them, their mothers are participating in the program as well. For some of them, their mothers are not. Now, the mothers who participate are not only trained to run the play schemes, they also have a monthly parenting workshop that covers a whole bunch of stuff about child development um, and creating a wholesome and healthy environment for the child. So, in a sense, these some of our sample have mothers who are also receiving a parenting intervention and some of our sample do not. And you can imagine that it's a very interesting question, how effects might differ um, be between kids whose mothers are participating and kids whose mothers are not and that it has the potential to tell us also what are the important components of the program. So in order to be able to talk about that, um, what we did is we had Lively Minds mobilize volunteer mothers, not only in treatment communities where they immediately become, start participating in the program, but also in the control communities. Why do we do that? Because we need uh, a control group in order to be able to assess effects on children or volunteer mothers. We need to identify an appropriate counterfactual. Um, and so um, this mobilization exercise in the control communities involved Lively Minds signing up mothers for the follow participation program in the following year. Um, of course, you may worry that mothers who sign up to participate now are going to be still different from mothers who sign up to participate in a year. It looks like when we run balance tests in our data, we don't see differences, systematic differences between volunteer mothers and treatment and control groups. Um, and the way that we did, so within our sample, we get, we have some volunteer mothers, obviously, because there's some in the community. And when we draw a random sample, we get some volunteer mothers. So of the 1,480 caregivers who signed up to be volunteer mothers in the 80 community, 437 were also in our sample. So we didn't do anything specific to sample volunteer mothers. They just happened to be in our sample and they're quite equally split between treatment and control. So in our analysis, we're able to look at effects on children whose mothers were not volunteer mothers, and whose mothers were. What's interesting, I think about this, please ask, do ask if any clarifying questions. So uh, what's interesting about this is, is that actually, you know, our intuition that we really need an appropriate counterfactual for these mothers turned out to be correct because if we compare the volunteer mothers to non-volunteer mothers there are some quite significant differences so women who volunteer to participate are different from women who don't um, so while they're similar on age education 
measures of IQ, we can we implement the Ravens assessment, um, socioeconomic status, health, child-related practice and knowledge. The thing that they're most different in is that they tend to already be more involved, have children in school and be more involved in the child's school. So what this shows is the proportion of non-volunteer mothers and volunteer mothers who have ever attended, who have a child who ever attended school, child currently in school, knows the name of the child's teacher, um, visited the school in the last month, ever attended a PTA meeting. Um, and the, the stars here indicate that this difference between non-volunteer mothers and volunteer mothers is significant. Um, so you can see that really the big difference is these mothers seem to be more likely to have older children in the household, more likely to have a kid already attending school and more likely to be engaged with the school already. I think this is kind of something to explore when we think about um, implementation of programs in the community and understanding the characteristics of people who do and do not volunteer uh, to participate and run these and how they relate to each other and how that may affect the impact of the program. Um, moving on to uh, quickly talk about the compliance. So we, we have data, uh, process data collected by Lively Minds and the Government Education Service through um, unannounced visits to schools um, during the time that the program was running. So between Lively Minds and, and Government Education Service, they made to nine to 10 visits and they found 78% of play schemes that were expected to be running, they found them running. Uh, on average, they found eight volunteer mothers and 24 kids present, so appropriate ratios, and 88% compliance with parenting workshops. So that comes from the data that Lively Minds are with the government education, collect with the Government Education Service. We also have some data in uh, our endline survey, which suggests that, uh, you know, what all these tables are showing is that parents, teachers are reporting parents participating more in treatment communities, which is what we would expect because of the volunteer mother scheme. Um, and parents are reporting more volunteering going on in the community, in the treatment communities than in the control communities. And all of that is being driven by individuals who are actually volunteer mothers. So this is all kind of consistent with, with the patterns we'd be expecting to see uh, with programs running in treatment communities and not control communities. So this is moving on now to presenting our main results. Um, this is our main um, specification. This is the model we estimate. Um, so uh, we regress the outcome of the child at school I at time T, the child I at school S at time T um, on the treatment indicator. So an indicator of whether the child's school is a treatment school. We control for uh, the same outcome at baseline because we have baseline and endline measures of all the um, child development uh, uh, measures. And uh, we also add in a, a set of controls for child household and school level uh, variables for which we observe imbalances at baseline. Um, and the strata here is an indicator for the randomization strata at the school level. We cluster the standard uh, errors at the level of the school. Now, before I uh, show the results on this set of outcomes, um, as well as mechanisms, I want to talk a little bit about uh, our measures of child development. So given this nature of the intervention where it's kind of getting kids to play different kinds of um, games that are targeting different um, types of skills, we really want to be able to look at effects on separate dimensions of cognitive and socio-emotional development. So we want, we want quite a sophisticated outcome measure, but at the same time, um, we are in a context where there's a limited number of tools that have been validated for this context. Um, and as I said, due to budget constraints, we have to rely on lay assessors and fairly limited assessment time. So we had about 40 minutes, 40 to 50 minutes of assessment time per child that we could fit within the budget. So what we try to do is to combine off the shelf, quicker, easier to administer tools that have been developed for in being implemented in large scale surveys with new measures, more experimental measures to kind of deepen our measure a little bit. So what we have is the Adela tool um, that some of you may know, it's a roughly 20 to 30 minute um, direct assessment tool, which captures several domains of child development, but is really quite limited. Um, the good thing about it is that it can, lay assessors can be trained on it, it can be done fairly quickly, and it's comparable to other studies in Ghana where it's been used, and it's been used in many, many low middle income countries. 
um, but it is fairly limited, so potentially not sophisticated enough to allow us to really detect effects, especially on separate domains. The second measure we use is the strength and difficulties questionnaire, from which I report to measure socio-emotional development. And we augment these measures uh, by um, tasks that were designed in the Spelke lab by Elizabeth Spelke at Harvard, um, which are intended to deepen measurement in key domains and reduce the risk that what we pick up are teaching to the test effects. And I'll give you an example of that. So here is the emergent numeracy module of Udela. Um, so our main child development assessment. Um, so comparison by size and length, sorting and classification, shape identification, puzzle completion, number identification. So that's the uh, numeracy module. You can see that a couple of these tasks are very closely related to the tasks that are uh, part of the play schemes. Puzzle task in particular and sorting and classification. This is something that kids do directly as part of the uh, Life in Minds program. And so in order to build on this measure, we add some different numeracy tasks. So these are emergent numeracy tasks designed by Elizabeth Spelke. Uh, so kids are asked to identify which one of the two boxes has more dots in the first task and point to uh, the shape which is different in these two boxes. Um, so this is this captures emergent numeracy as well, but it's a different set of measures. Um, so what we do then with all of these interrelated measures that we have is combine them into broader constructs. So what we do is we score each of the measures using IRT. And then we conduct confirmatory factor analysis to aggregate the score across tasks to measure the domains that we're interested in. So maybe I can pause for questions. This is a very quick summary of what we're doing. And I, I, I don't have the time to kind of show you, it'd be nice to show you more of the tools and how we do this kind of mapping of tasks to domains. Um, but uh, I hope this is sort of clear enough to carry on and look at impact. Okay, so um, this is our main set of results. Here we look at impacts on um, children's cognitive development. Overall, we find a treatment effect of 0.14 of a standard deviation improvement in cognitive development in the aggregated measure of cognitive development. And that consists of the numeracy, literacy, executive function, and fine motor subdomains. And you can see that we get significant impacts of around the same uh, magnitude. 0.13 to 0.16 of a standard deviation. Uh, for numeracy, executive function, and fine motor, we don't find quite statistically significant literacy effects, although I will show you later that they're there for um, children, or more disadvantaged children. Um, and we, for the numeracy in particular, we can break that down into further subdomains and show that the effects are really being driven by impacts on spatial ability and numeric vocabulary in particular. This is the, the, our impact um, on, on children's cognitive development. The next- uh, uh, Sonia, there is a question uh, from yeah. Matthias. He wants to know whether we did the multidimensional IRT or in unidimensional concurrent models for each subdimension. Unidimensional, unidimensional model. So, and this is something that we want to, this is, we're, we're kind of writing up these results um, we, we did this in a, I think we can do this in a more efficient way, this estimation. At the moment, um, we score each assessment separately using IRT, and then we combine them in CFA. So that, that's not the most efficient way to do it, but that's, that's what these results are based on. Okay. Uh, looking at the socio-emotional subdomain, we don't find a statistical impact overall, uh, but we do see a reduction in externalizing programs. So the uh, behavior problems, just to be clear, the socio-emotional score is higher for better socio-emotional, well, higher socio-emotional well-being, uh, whereas the externalizing and internalizing problems, the higher the score, the higher the problem. So uh, we find in particular a significant reduction in inter externalizing problems and a nearly, well, not, not in this table, sorry. So, so really it's the externalizing pro problems where we see uh, some indication of an impact, but not overall. So overall, the impact on socio-emotional skills seem to be 
um, weaker. And finally, looking at the health effects. Um, so this is something that actually in the remainder of the paper we, we don't really explore, but it is something we would like to explore when we, when we look at, uh, when we do the next evaluation, hopefully. Um, and that is that we get surprisingly large health effects. Um, uh, so the only measure that we have, the only kind of objective measure we have is mid upper arm circumference. Part of the reason we didn't really invest in health measurement is because our prior was that this intervention is unlikely to have large health effects. So we wanted to check that, but we did not capture height and weight in the way we would have if this was really a, 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 you know, a design to evaluate health effects. So these are surprising. Why? Because the health component of the program consists of education for the volunteer mothers about how to make nutritional food, as well as promotion of better hygiene practices in the schools through hand washing uh, and in the homes through the for the volunteer mother children. We don't see differences between volunteer mother children and non-volunteer mother children in this impact. And so this effect therefore must be coming through what's happening in the schools. And really this is this kind of hand washing improvement. Nevertheless, we see almost a 25%, uh, so this 23% reduction in acute malnutrition based on the mid upper arm circumference measure. Um, although we don't see uh, any changes, any effects when we use the caregiver report of child health. Overall health morbidity is something on chronic problems, but it's weakly significant. And, um, if we correct for multiple hypothesis, testing disappears. So this is definitely something we'll explore if, if we do the next uh, scale up evaluation. This is something we'd like to understand better. But for the remainder of the presentation, I focus on the effects on cognitive development and socio-emotional skills. This is something I just added in right before the presentation because I thought it is interesting to highlight that the effects of the program are significantly larger. The cognitive impacts are significantly larger overall on children um, from the bottom 20% of households by socioeconomic status. Um, and that goes for both numeracy and literacy. For executive functioning and fine motor skills, but in particular executive functioning is the other way around. For the executive functioning, the impacts are higher for kids from better off households. Um, but really the significant difference overall between poor and richer children is that poor effects are higher on poorer children and that's driven by a larger effect on numeracy and an effect on literacy. For the socio-emotional effect, the interesting heterogeneity finding is that really they're being driven by boys. So these improvements are really only there for boys at the light green column. So this is the impact for boys is 0.2 of a standard deviation improvement even in the overall socio-emotional measure for which we don't see overall impacts because there's no effect on girls. And we see that that's being driven by reduction in externalizing pro behaviors for boys and internalizing behavior for boys. So, so um, uh, for girls, we really don't see uh, any improvement. Now, um, before I talk about mechanisms, uh, I want to look at this heterogeneity by volunteer mother status, because that's an interesting first step to considering where these impacts that we're finding might be coming from. So what I present in this table are separately estimated treatment effects among children whose mother is not a volunteer mother and children whose mother is a volunteer mother. Now remember, these children are being compared to children whose mother is opted into being a volunteer mother in the control group, but haven't yet become a volunteer mother. Um, so, so we have a kind of appropriate counterfactual for these children. Um, the, the main takeaway here is that for cognitive, for effects on cognitive skills, um, we don't see significant differences, although the coefficients differ a little bit and some are significant and some are not. When we test for significance, and this is the p-value for the test of equality of coefficients between the volunteer and non-volunteer mother effect, um, we don't find any of these differences to be significant. So for cognitive skills, effects seem to be equally strong for kids, for volunteer mothers and non-volunteer mothers. But this is not the case when we look at impacts on socio-emotional skills. Here, there's a clear indication that those impacts are being driven by children of volunteer mothers. So for children of volunteer mothers, there is a 0.33, so a third of a standard deviation improvement in overall socio-emotional skills. And this is being driven by a reduction in externalizing and internalizing behaviors. And the differences here between effects on volunteer, on children of volunteer mothers and non-volunteer mothers are statistically significant. So this is sort of, this is an interesting difference. 
um, suggesting possibly all different channels for the ways in which the program affects cognitive development versus socio-emotional development and that we then explore a little bit further. Taking a step back and thinking about, okay, if, if we want to look at mechanisms, where could the effects be coming from? They could be coming from the direct effect of play schemes, so doing the puzzles develops in, in numeracy skills. They can be coming through change in behavior of teachers and changes in the school environment, or they could be coming in changes in behavior of parents, uh, skills, knowledge, well-being. Uh, there we would expect, if that was a, a driving uh, force, we'd expect the effects to be stronger for children of volunteer mothers who were exposed to more of this kind of parenting component, although there may be some spillovers to other parents. Um, now, as I said in the beginning, we're underpowered to look at um, anything at the school or teacher level. And so we focus on uh, parent level. Um, so with parents, we, we uh, have measures of parental knowledge about child development and best practice in terms of the kind of channels through which parental changes among parents could be affecting child development. So it could be through better parental knowledge. It could be through better availability of developmentally appropriate materials in the household. It could be changes in parental practices and behavior. Um, and it could be changes in parental well-being. One of the things that Lively Minds is emphasizes a lot is that in their view, a big uh, impact of the program is empowerment of the women who participate and improvement of their self-esteem and mental health. Um, which would then translate into impact of, on the kids. Just again to touch on measurement, we kind of use the same approach, combining off the shelf scales um, to measure caregiver knowledge with exploratory new measures. So for caregiver knowledge, we use the kitty items from the kitty, which is a well-established measure of knowledge about child development. But in order to capture um, measures of school quality, um, knowledge about what makes a good preschool. Um, we actually developed our own tools. These are entirely exploratory, but we're really unhappy with the tools that were out there. We really wanted to capture some variation in what parents consider to be a good preschool environment. And so what we did is we had four sets of pictures. This is one of them, in which parents had to just choose the picture which shows a better preschool, a preschool that's better for, for children. Um, so this one relates to um, teaching style. So you can see a, a kind of teacher standing in front of the class and kind of lecturing the kids versus playing uh, in a group. Um, and we had ones for disciplined, uh, for disciplined parent teacher interaction and quality of space. So a structurally more attractive space versus a space that had educational materials, toys and books. Um, in terms of measuring caregiver behavior, again, we used the family cares indicator, which is an established measure of resources available at home, as well as um, parental reports of productive activities and time use with kids. But then we also um, introduced the parent-child interactions uh, observation, uh, in which we worked with Mark Bornstein, who's a child development specialist, to develop macro codes, which lay interviewers could code while observing child and caregiver playing games. So this is something that took about 10 minutes. Caregivers play two games with the child and the um, assessors uh, coded how they were playing examples of items that they were coding to include things like the parent praised the child responded positively when completed part of a task. Uh, parent acted intrusively not allowing child to solve uh, the problem on their own, etc. So there were about 16 items um, for um, kind of teaching style and 16 items for discipline. I have to go through this, unfortunately, sadly, I have to go through this a little bit too quickly, but maybe we can pick up some questions in the discussion. Um, so here's the impact. So the first step in disentangling mechanisms is we look at program impacts on these potential mediators. What we find is um, that there is an improvement in knowledge about child development among volunteer mothers only. We, throughout, we show treatment effects separately for volunteer mothers and non-volunteer mothers. And we see an impact for both on, um, uh, on the school knowledge about school quality measure. In terms of parenting practice, we don't see any impact on materials available, but we do see a significant improvement in the amount of productive time spent with a child for children of volunteer mother children 
uh, for volunteer mothers, not for children of non-volunteer mothers. And using our observational measure, we see an improvement in teaching style, which is how the parent, we're calling it teaching style, that may not actually be an appropriate term, um, but this is how the parent gets the child to complete the tasks rather than what they do when the child isn't listening or, or isn't following, um, is misbehaving, which is the punishing behaviors um, domain, which we don't find any impacts on. We also don't see any impacts on measures of maternal well-being, caregiver well-being, depression, where we use the self-report questionnaire, of the, I don't, the 10 item version, I think, um, and the self-esteem uh, adapted version of the Rosenberg scale. We, we don't find any impacts here, but equally, we did not invest a lot into measurement of these outcomes. And so in the bigger study, that is something that we would want to explore uh, more. The final part of the evaluation is where we kind of try and see how much mediating power these behavioral changes um, have for the impacts that we find. So what I show here is the correlation between these measures of parental knowledge and parental behavior with our key child outcomes, so cognitive score overall, as well as subdomains where we find effects, as well as what happens to our treatment effect when we add um, the measures that are significant um, into the specification. So essentially the takeaway here is um, there is a correlation between cognitive development and our measure of teaching style, this is from the parental observation, as well as a harsh punishment in the directions that you would expect, but these do not mediate the impacts we find. They're not affected by the treatment, so that's as, as expected. What we do find, however, is that um, this behavior change does seem to mediate about a third of the effect uh, on socio-emotional development um, among volunteer mother sample. Here we focus on the volunteer mother sample because really it's, it's the socio-emotional changes, improvements are being driven by children of volunteer mothers. Um, and so this table is, shows the correlation between socio-emotional development and these measures of parental knowledge and behavior, externalizing problems and internalizing problems and then show specifications. This is the treatment effect without controlling for these. And this is the treatment effect with controlling for these. Uh, and we see that um, there is a difference, a statistically significant difference um, in the treatment coefficients. And so, so these, these factors do seem to mediate the effects that we find. Um, and to the extent that we can interpret this causally, which we have to do with caution, uh, that seems to be explaining about a third of the impact. So just summing this up and hopefully taking two minutes to uh, tell you about the scale up. Um, so uh, we show these findings from an RCT of a low cost DC program for preschool aged kids being scaled through the public preschool system in rural Ghana and, and find significant positive impacts um, on cognitive development and reduction in disruptive behavior. Um, I think an interesting thing that we want to explore further is that these results suggest that both the play scheme and parenting channels are important for child development, but that different key inputs for development of cognitive and socio-emotional skills could be different. So socio-emotional development may require more sustained intervention um, with parents uh, to improve child interactions than the, the um, cognitive development. Maybe I'll pause and... Um, answer any follow-up questions, but I have a couple of slides on the scale-up. Okay, then I'll, I'll do two minutes on the scale-up. Uh, so I mentioned that um, these RCT findings, as well as, of course, uh, the, the Lively Minds efforts, have motivated the government Ghana to partner with Lively Minds for phase scale-up. So they've agreed to scale up to 60 districts over the next four years. That's going to be going into 4,000 preschools and around one, reaching about 1.1 million children. Um, and during the scale up, essentially, Lively Minds will hand over ownership of the program to the Government Education Service. Um, and they will, they will have a role in the first two years, but that's strictly advising the um, government and uh, building capacity for the government to run the program. So they will not be directly involved in the training or running uh, of the program. And the Government Education Service in particular are keen to embed an RCT into the scale up 
to assess a that the program whether the program remains effective but also build a case for maintaining it over the longer term as well as determine success criteria so if they were going to continue monitoring uh, the program what what would they monitor um, and so the basic design that we have proposed that is feasible and that they're happy with um, is a, a step wedged clustered RCT leveraging the fact that there's a phase scale up. So we have groups of districts that will be treated a lot earlier than other groups of districts and we are therefore able to construct treatment and control groups over this period. Um, in our basic design we will have 54 districts sample and 162 schools and about 1800 children. So the, the thing that's going to really uh, I think separate this from what we've done already. In addition to the assessments, the kind of assessments that you saw and sort of evaluation that we've done, we will obviously want to answer the question about whether effects found in efficacy trial are sustained. And we will want to look at how effects vary by child, parent, teacher characteristics. But we really want to be able to say more about the role of the district characteristics. So that is the district infrastructure and the district government. Um, as well as the role of how the program is implemented. So intervention, fidelity and compliance, um, much more so than what we attempted to do uh, in, the, in the efficacy trial. Um, there's scope for assembling quite detailed implementation data, both through monitoring that's planned by the government and through support from Lively Minds. Um, and so I guess the, the kind of key empirical challenges that we've been thinking about um, for for really pushing in this direction is something that probably a lot of you who are working with implementation data think about, that obviously our, our impact evaluation design doesn't allow us to have random variation in these different program components and quality of implementation elements that we want to say something about. So if we want to go beyond descriptive mediation analysis um, or heterogeneity analysis, we really need to be thinking about strategies for overcoming potential endogeneity of um, variation in these factors. Um, I might just leave this slide here, um, but hopefully that gives you sort of an idea of where we're going next, as well as where it would be great to kind of have further discussion with you and learn from your experience of uh, implementation research. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you so much, Sonia. Uh, so I'm sure there's a lot of interest. There's so many parallels. I want to open it up to others um, before I take and ask any questions. Do you have questions from the group? Please feel free to unmute yourself. So one question I have, uh, Tonya, is, a, is about looking back on, on your measures and that trade-off between how much time you had to assess and how sensitive to change the measures you selected were. And if you were to go back and, and swap some things out or have a do-over, where would you put that emphasis? What would you advise others? Because we're doing some work very similar to this and we always have that um, difficult choice to make about how long, how burdensome, the cost of proprietary measures versus off the shelf, you know, adapted version. So I'd love your thoughts as we're thinking about doing similar work in Rwanda and Sierra Leone. Yes. Um, I mean, I, I think that that in principle, having that element of a well-established measure uh, like the Adela off the shelf measures um, not only makes the in, uh, implementation more feasible, but also potentially allows for some interesting additional analysis. So for example, um, when we're thinking about the size, how big are these impacts? And this is something that Oratsu has been thinking about. Um, you know, we, we also have uh, uh, data from urban Ghana using the Adela assessment. Uh, and so we can sort of look at, relate the size of our impacts to, for example, the gap between children in rural and urban areas in Ghana. And having that core measure, which is comparable across, across context, I think is really valuable in, in both for ease of implementation, but also for thinking about how to put findings in context. But these state-of-the-art measures like Liz's measure, I feel like that really gave us the kind of depth of measurement, the sort of variation sensitivity um, that, that uh, we needed in order to 
detect overall, if not just overall effects, but which where they're coming from. And that is something that was important for library minds because they actually have adapted their curriculum quite significantly based on these findings. In particular, they were quite struck by the um, literacy finding, the lack of literacy effects, mm -hmm. um, weaker literacy effects, which they've now pushed on with, with and, and strengthened in their curriculum. So I think we would sort of start off from the same point. And, and I feel like there's that core that has to be there for comparability and for implement, uh, implement feasibility. But then I would push as far as possible in order to enrich that. I think that really adds a lot um, to um, you know the, the kind of precision and depth of the data. That's not yeah, a very nice answer. <laughs> oh, no, that, that was really helpful. And I'd love to know about your harsh punishment or harsh treatment of children measure. And then what's the role of fathers in any of this work? How do we get the men more involved? So, um, I think lively minds try, I'm think, they have been, they are very concerned with fathers because they're, you know, they, they rely on, they mobilize people in the community, but they rely on volunteer participation. And that is exclusively women who volunteer to participate in this. Um, they're not even going to households where maybe they could make extra efforts to engage men. They really get women to come to a place in the community and um, get it anyone who's interested who always happens to be women. One way I think that they're hoping to be engaging men more is that they have recently added as a result, partially in response to the ongoing um, lockdown, um, they've added a radio program to, to kind of the portfolio of things that they do. Uh, and this is something that obviously reaches households um, and discusses both child development, but also kind of follows their curriculum and tries to through radio propose to parents simple games that they can be playing with their children. Um, they haven't conducted any sort of evaluation of that, but one of the things they would, they're super keen to know is whether that engages fathers more. Um, but I think it is a great challenge and I don't think this program um, as it stands is really you know, designed in a way that could encourage fathers to come. But it'd be interesting to hear how, I know that is something that um, you think about in Rwanda and how, how you think about it there. Right. Yeah. And I would say our corollary is more like your volunteer mother and the household environment. You know, we're really targeting both um, anyone who's involved in raising the kid. If it's a dual headed household, the father, mother, grandmother, grandfather, uh, and, and we do it through home visiting. And that allows mm -hmm. us to really make sure that that dad is involved in the play sessions. Um, what is your violence uh, measure that you use? We we don't have a violence measure. We, we have harsh punishment measure. Uh-huh. What is, what is that? So the harsh punishment measure, um, I, I actually have it up. So these are items. So there's, there's two sets. These are when the, um, the, when the interviewer is observing the mother playing the game with her child. Now, one of the games is fun and simple. And one of them is a sorting task where the mother kind of has to encourage the child to figure out what to do more. Mm -hmm. So this is a scale that's partly built on the mixed scale um, of, um, uh, kind of how harsh the disciplining measures that parents have are. I can send you exactly what items we are using, um, but it's kind of what parents are doing in response to children disobeying. In addition to that, we ask similar items to the parent with reference to the previous month, because one of the challenges is, especially with something like this, when you're observing a parent playing with a kid for 10 minutes, you are likely to not see anything. So we also ask parents what kind of disciplining measures they use. Um, have used over the last month. That's the extent of, of um, harsh punishment or violence measures that we have. Yeah, no, we should definitely have some follow-up because we'd love to talk with you more about the implementation science work we're doing in Rwanda. I do see a question from Jane. Jane, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Um, oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Oh, okay, great. Hi, thank you very much. Um, I tend towards the parent-child interaction focus in my work. And so I was curious where you're going to head with what you observed that that there needs to be more, maybe a more explicit focus on that, if if that will become a part of the intervention or that for another day. I, was, I just wasn't sure about that piece. Thank you. Right. So I think that's, I mean, I think where we're going to go with the analysis of the current data is to really um, check the more thoroughly kind of build up that analysis. But it does seem to be, I think there, there are two takeaways from that. 
One is that the current, the design, this kind of hybrid design of Lively Minds, which sets it apart from other early childhood programs, where it kind of is targeting the parents and the preschools at the same time. And even though it's not targeting all of the parents, even that, that component is clearly adding to the impact that this program is having. And so one of our big recommendations to the government has been, as they scale up, to not change the model that in a way where, for example, these teaching assistants do, do the play schemes. Based on our findings, if they were to do that, potentially um, the cognitive effects would still be there that we're finding. But the socio-emotional improvements wouldn't be there. Um, and so, you know, within that model, the fact that some of the kids have their parents being involved is really important. The other one is more about thinking about child development. I think broadly in the literature, there is recognition of the fact that different inputs matter for different domains of child development, but still not a lot of robust evidence on where those differences lie. And so here we have a pretty good design in order to be able to look at that and say, well, this parent-child interaction seems particularly important for socio-emotional development. So if you want to target socio-emotional development, then perhaps school-based interventions through teachers are not the way to do it. That you really need that parental engagement. On the flip side, the cognitive development, it seems like um, you know, the preschool model seems to be important. So that, I think that also just answers a, a, or, or contributes to an answer to a bigger question about um, how ch the development process for children, how it differs across different domains. Great. Can, can I add something to what Sonia just sure. said? Because I think this is a really important um, set of issues. Um, you know, the evidence from here is uh, is what was Sonia was saying that the um, uh, the impact on on cognition seems to happen mainly in the childcare center, while the social emotional uh, happens more at home. And so it's important to try to engage. Uh, the, the parents. But I think uh, one should also go beyond that and to think maybe on cognition at earlier ages, before age three, uh, what happens at home is very important. In any case, one should think, and you know, especially for you guys working on implementation science, uh, one should, uh, should think of uh, ways to engage parents uh, into into what happens in the community. In this case, the, um, um, this particular childcare centers, but in, a, in other contexts could be other models. So for instance, uh, you know, some work I've been doing in India with Pratam, uh, the anger Wadi centers can be improved dramatically, but at the same time, they are very visible in the community center, in the community as a center where things happen and that can be used and in infrastructure can be used to deliver uh, messages that affect behavior uh, and involve parents uh, and families directly. Fabulous, very important points and really thinking across the ecology of child development from the home environment to the community and also the broader policy issues all covered today. So we wanna thank you both so much. I'm sorry we're at time, but uh, let's definitely set up a time to follow up. There's so much richness here and it's really impressive work and we're just so honored to have had you today. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, take care everyone. Look forward to seeing you all soon. Thank you. Bye.